There are two modes of invading private property. The first, by which the poor plunder the rich, it's sudden and violent. The second, by which the rich plunder the poor, it's slow and legal. Government by organised money is just as dangerous as government by organised mob. Kia ora tato, Takawingo Marcus Wilkins, Ke Mackenzie Elvin Law, Aho e Mahi, Ana Namihi Nui Ka Nahura Ahre o Taranga Moana, Namihi Nui Kia Koto Kato, Kite Atua Tenakwe, Kia Papatuanuku. Uh, tenakwe. Ki te whare wananga o Waikato. Tenakwe. Ki te hunga mātei. Ki te hunga o rā. Tenakoto. Tenakoto. Tenakoto katoa. My name is Marcus Wilkins. I'm a partner of Mackenzie Olvin. I'm pleased to have members of my firm here and my partners, Graham, Fiona and Tom. We welcome you as a firm this evening in election week to a public lecture, which is the first of what we hope will be annual public lectures that we facilitate in this magnificent facility, which is a great addition to our city. I think you'll all agree. We're not doing this for any organisation. We're doing this fundamentally because we're lawyers, and the first rule in our rule book is that we are to facilitate the rule of law, the administration of justice and preserve the rule of law. As a firm, we believe we've got an obligation to do that and to ensure that our freedom and way of life is not diminished over the years through the erosion of the rule of law. So we see public lectures such as this as fulfilling both of those objectives. So before we start this evening, there's a bit of housekeeping. Inevitably, emergency exits at the back and to the side if an alarm is raised. Um, don't all rush to this exit. That goes immediately outside, but you can also access that way bathrooms outside. Um, please, if you haven't already done so, could you turn your telephones off? Um, that's a bit distracting. So you probably want to wonder why I began with those two quotes and where they're from. The first is from the work of a fellow called John Taylor, who was an American a politician and philosopher, uh, writing in 1814. Into his book was called An Inquiry into the Principles and Purposes of the Government of the United States. Now the second, of course, is from Depression Era and Wartime President Franklin Delano Roosevelt. Uh, if any of you students of history will know about him. And sandwiched somewhere in between those two gentlemen in 1863, Abraham Lincoln said at Gettysburg to the American people at the end of the Civil War that their duty was to ensure that government for the people, by the people, of the people, shall not perish from the earth. I believe those quotes are relevant to our lecture tonight. Both Taylor and Roosevelt warned of the peril to democracy of what Taylor would have described as the moneyed mercantile class. Lincoln's call was to government by the people, not a plutocracy. So those of us who cherish democracy, in the vein that Lincoln spoke of, I think they're just adjusting the sound, uh, must accept that 137 years later, we stand at the edge of a precipice. Uh, and the real possibility that democracy, government of the people, by the people, for the people, is in danger of perishing. Certainly there is some perishing of the institutions going on around the world, and we're not immune from that. In my introductory remarks, I also spoke of our obligations as lawyers to the rule of law, um, I'll just say a few words about that because I realise that for many people, even dare I say it, some of our elected representatives, um, this could be just an abstract concept. <laughs> um, at its, that wasn't really intended as a dig. Um, at its most basic, it means, of course, that government and those who govern are subject to the same laws and treatment as the citizens they govern. Um, there must also be within society, an, what did you call an attitude of legality? So if government is to be seen to be under the law and then there's to be an attitude of legality, then there must be public trust and confidence 
not just in the independence of the judiciary and the law enforcement agencies, but also in the laws, the laws which govern how we live together, how we conduct our economic affairs together, and how we elect our representatives. So here are some rhetorical questions for you to ponder before you hear from Max and Tim. Do we have a problem when our Chief Justice says that the civil courts are too expensive for low and middle income families and people and that our legal aid system is wanting? Do we have a problem when the head of the serious forward office declares that conflicts of interest are not well understood in New Zealand? Do we have a problem when a corporate can spend the equivalent of the entire annual budget of the Serious Fraud Office dealing with an investigation and being ably assisted by former officers of the Serious Fraud Office who've set themselves up in business to do this. Do we have a problem when a corporate advisory major can write a report which claims that competition is suppressing price escalation when the corporate commissioning that, commissioning that report enjoys market shares of 85 to 94 per cent in key component areas which feed into housing costs for every New Zealander. Do we have a problem when a cabinet minister can leave office one day and take a job at one of our four major trading banks the next or become a corporate lobbyist for a major law firm, or the latest one, become a strategic advisory director. You can ponder those things as you listen to Tim and Max. I'll introduce them both now. Tim's work, uh, including his just released book, we'll have some sales pitch later. Um, it's got a great title, Tyranny of Greed. <laughs> Trump, corruption, and the revolution to come. So in that book, he explores the connection between rising inequality and political corruption, particularly when it comes to the undue influence of concentrated wealth over law and policy. Max, uh, well known to quite a few of you, I'm sure, has written extensively about inequality and the need for democratic renewal in New Zealand. His recent article in The Guardian drew attention to the fact that the wealthiest 10% of us have 60% of the total assets of the nation. Max is the author of Government for the Public Good and the editor of the best-selling work Inequality, a New Zealand Crisis. Together, Tim and Max will explain the issues and offer ideas for renewing our democracy and making the good society that we claim in our egalitarian Kiwi way, more of a reality than what it is today, which is a myth. So I will hand over to Tim, who will be followed by Max. I won't introduce them separately. There will be time for questions at the end, um, so if you hold those and think about them after they've both uh, spoken and given you their thoughts. So over to you, Tim. Okay, wait, now it's back on. I, I can tell that's a lot louder. Um, okay, that was, uh, let's see, glad we're back on track. Anyhow, what I was saying was that I'm glad so many of us can turn out to discuss issues of the importance, um, of this magnitude of importance, such as inequality, money in politics, and the integrity of the overall system of government um, that, of course, is the framework behind uh, the vote. So, um, let's see. What I want to do is actually start off with a couple of questions for you. Um, I'd like to see a show of hands. It just felt like this just went off again. Okay. I'd like to see a show of hands for how many people in the room feel as though New Zealand is a special place to live and work and raise a family. Uh, all right. So that's virtually everyone in the room. Um, 
I feel like that sort of the currency of New Zealand has been heightened, has been elevated by its ability to contend with COVID. I feel like the, the currency of the country, the reputation of the country has only increased in the month since uh, February or March. And I feel like part of that is because the government was paying attention to science. And the government was not only paying attention to science and evidence, but it was paying attention to the value of human life, even the lives of those uh, who might have been a minority of the population, but who were most vulnerable. And so there was a certain amount of compassion and care there, I think, behind the government's response that people respected even if they didn't agree with it. And there was something that struck me as a foreigner, um, as you might be able to tell from my accent, I'm from the Northeast of the United States. There was something that struck me as especially different or refreshing about that, that people, even if they didn't fully agree with the government's response, respected it and had a sense that it was their duty, perhaps a civic duty, uh, perhaps a duty to be a good team player, to collaborate um, along, the, along sort of in the manner of the social compact, right, that I might follow the rules, even if I don't agree with them, because I believe in the overall legitimacy of the system of government, and I believe that when my team gets in power, of course, I'd like the other side to follow the rules that we enact legitimately. And I understand there's a controversy about the legitimacy of the lockdown rules, but I'm, I'm speaking in general terms about what impressed me along the lines of this, in this sort of rule of law and social compact feeling that I think was going on in New Zealand. Now, Ignore the pandemic now for a second and think back, uh, if you can, if you can imagine times, uh, normal times before, think back, say, to how you felt about New Zealand in 2019. How many people in the room felt that New Zealand was a special place given the way the 21st century has been unfolding? And what I mean by how the 21st century has been, been unfolding is that the democracy indices, the World Bank governance scores, the Transparency International corruption indices, Freedom House sorts of NGO reports have been recording an overall democratic decline. Uh, there's a general sense of democratic backsliding in many countries around the world. In fact, in 113 countries around the world, there's been 13 years of decline in rule of law, in integrity of elections, quality of government, public belief in the rules and in participation. There's been a general decline. So when I think about is if, if New Zealand is a special place, it's not just about COVID, right? It's about the sense that there's still some hope for a government here with integrity. Uh, there's still some sense of belonging and participation among the populace. I understand we have an issue with voter turnout, especially among the young. But how many people even before COVID felt along the lines of democratic quality that New Zealand was a special place to live. Right, so essentially the same response. Now, different question. Um, how many of you feel as though that relatively high degree of democratic quality is safe, secure, entrenched, guaranteed to last no matter what we do? in the next couple of years or decades. Put your hand up if you feel confident, unequivocally confident about the future of your democracy here. Things, she'll be right, what's the expression? She'll be right, yeah? Uh, and I don't see, a, uh, I see one hand, two hands. No matter what we do in the next couple of years or decades, she'll be right. All right, but it's, it's an extremely small minority. Okay, um, let me ask another question then, and I have a feeling you're gonna be sympathetic to this one, but I still wanna see. Okay, um, the most important, what's the most important issue facing New Zealand then? If we agree that this country is special, it's special in its response to the pandemic, it's special in its respect for the social compact, it's special in the quality of its democracy, and of course it's not just you know, the democratic backsliding, it's the environmental degradation. It's the rising inequality across most countries, including most advanced democracies. It's an extremely bleak picture that the 21st century is giving us so far. I mean, you can read people like Steven Pinker at Harvard, who gives us a lot of reasons to be grateful to be alive now, as opposed to, I don't know, the Middle Ages. And in a lot of ways, he's right, but he's wrong when it comes to the environmental stuff, right? Never before in human history have we been a danger to our own survival? Have we caused mass extinctions ourselves? Yeah, okay, 
We hunted the moa, or what have you. But mass extinctions of this scale have never been seen before, except with meteorites, volcanic eruptions, that kind of thing, right? So there is a sort of collective insanity going on in the 21st century, and I think New Zealand feels special in that way as well, right? Because there's hope for self-governance. Um, so along those lines, what would be the most important issue then facing the country? Um, I've taken a list of issues from public opinion surveys uh, in New Zealand, and the things that tend to come up as the most important issue fa facing New Zealand include, of course, the housing crisis, shortages, rising prices, wages, which ties into the housing crisis because the ratio between wages and the cost of housing is so bad that the United Nations has declared it a human rights violation along the lines of social and economic rights to, to housing. Um, what else? Wealth concentration, inequality, trust, tax evasion, this sort of stuff. Um, by the way, good book for sale over here about that sort of thing on my left. Um, poverty, including child poverty. Uh, despite our positive feeling about New Zealand, we have to own up to the fact that there is a, a, a sizable percentage here that's well, quite concerning along the lines of child poverty. Um, economic competition and foreign trade, of course, there's some... Uh, discomfort, right, around the potential for New Zealand industries to be, uh, whether they can enjoy fair competition or not with larger trading partners, whether there's going to be interference from larger trading partners in ways that benefit them at the expense of, of ordinary Kiwis and so on. Uh, the proper role, of, speaking of which, the proper role of foreign powers in New Zealand's sovereign affairs. Um, so, you know, and, and of course the country's ability to cope with, with climate change and environmental degradation, migration flows that are going to be happening as a result of this, and, and drought that we're already experiencing in many regions. Okay, so here's the general list. When you look at this, do most of you, raise your hand if you find what you think to be the most important issue reflected here. Raise your hand. My most important issue is reflected here. Okay, so this is about half, I would say. Um, now look, I'm gonna give a caveat in a second about who am I to even be raising this issue or offering my opinion um, as someone who's only been here for a couple of years, um, though I do have lifelong residence now. Uh, that's a bit of a warning to you all in the audience. I could be here forever. Um, but all right, if I'm allowed, if you'll indulge me and you'll allow me to weigh in on this, I would say that the most important issue facing New Zealand is not on this list. In my mind, the most important face issue facing New Zealand are the obstacles to deciding any of these issues in a genuinely democratic way. That's what I think it would be. The near impossibility of deciding these issues in a, de in a genuinely democratic way. And of course, we're going to disagree potentially on what a genuinely democratic way means. Um, and that, in a sense, is what my talk is about. Threats to genuinely democratic elections, threats to genuinely democratic lawmaking processes, threats to genuinely democratic modes of representation, responsiveness, participation, and so on. Okay, so I promised I would give you a bit of a caveat um, or a bit of a um, ask for permission, I guess the phrase would be, uh, to weigh in on this issue at all. So who am I to be even addressing these things? Um, you know, when I look back at my home country, I feel like it's science fiction. Um, I feel like when I'm at public events abroad, I feel like some sort of alien sent from a civilization that's gone wrong, right? Or a time traveler, right? Sent from the future, from a time when things went so bizarrely wrong that he had to go back to warn people in the past not to take the road that had been taken, right? So actually maybe somebody who's from America, although I'm not from Trump's America, but someone from uh, the land currently ruled by Trump is actually maybe a pretty good person to address issues of democratic integrity because my homeland has been absolutely decimated. It's been absolutely decimated by what or who Matt Taibbi, this writer and journalist, called the insane clown president, which I thought was a pretty interesting description. Um, I would give maybe slightly less politically oriented words than that. I would say, uh, technically speaking, I would say uh, that what we're dealing with in the United States is the first kleptocratic, categorically untruthful and manipulative, utterly shameless and narcissistic, transparently ignorant, racist and sexist, proudly illiberal and authoritarian, deeply paranoid and conspiratorial, and clearly disloyal, if not treasonous, president in US history. Now, and that I would say, oh, no. <laughs> that I would say is the technical description 
for what President Trump is or for who President Trump is. And I make that case in my book. Actually, I also make the case that he's a biblical demon um, because I think that's what best captures the degree to which his corruption has manifested and transformed the United States of America. But let me say another thing. Uh, so who, you know, Trump feels like, you know, he's so extreme, that could never happen here, right? So, you know, to the extent that a lot of us raised our hand, and I would be among those who raised my hand and said there's something special about New Zealand's democracy, the number one concern I would have when I also raised my hand and said, yeah, but it can be somewhat vulnerable, I wouldn't be thinking vulnerable to the likes of Trump. I would be thinking that's an American aberration. That's an American horror story. That can only happen in America. Well, you know, I don't know, um, Bolsonaro in Brazil? Clearly homophobic, clearly anti-environmental, clearly authoritarian. Modi in India, maybe it's a tougher case. Certainly I've met a fair number of Modi supporters. Um, even a tougher case would be the UK Independence Party and Nigel Farage, Boris Johnson. But when you look at the demographics of who elected those politicians who are leading the, the lead, who led the Leave campaign, very similar demographic to Trump. Um, when you look at the conditions that gave rise to Modi, um, that gave rise to the law and justice policy in Poland, the Jobbik party in Hungary. There's a sort of similar recipe that comes together to produce illiberal and authoritarian and populist in, a, in the bad sense of the term populist, because I think there's also a good sense of the term, but populist in the bad sense of the term, sorts of parties and politicians which are on the rise in many regions of the world. It's not just Trump. You know, Trump's biography might be aberrational. His personality, having narcissistic personality disorder and that sort of thing might be a bit aberrational. But the phenomenon, the, the underlying reasons for his rise to power are not aberrational. And that's the sense in which you can conceive of me as that strange time traveler who says, don't go down this road. Because, you know, the newspaper headlines when Trump was elected were along the lines of shock, uh, what is it, shock and awe, um, that sort of thing. But to anyone paying attention, I think Trump's rise to power is quite predictable. And here's what I mean. Uh, so Trump was elected, quote unquote elected, by the Electoral College, of course, not by the popular vote, which he lost by three million, but he was quote unquote elected in 2016. If you were paying attention, two years before the election, there was this flurry of revelations by researchers. One of them is uh, the gentleman on the left, uh, the French economist Thomas Piketty. And Thomas Piketty published this longitudinal uh, analysis, his data set was 1970 to 2010, of economic inequality in the United States, um, interested in inequality along the lines of income and inequality along the lines of wealth or capital, right, which includes your investments, your stocks, your bonds, your, your property, your housing, all these things, right? So Piketty comes out and he reveals that the United States of America is actually the most unequal of all advanced democracies. Yeah, that, that's his finding. He says the top 10% in the United States has captured 72% of the nation's total wealth, leaving how much for the bottom half? You know, when I ask, I mean, it's right up there on the slide. No, it's not yet. Okay, there's still a sense of mystery. Um, leaving how much for the bottom half? My students tend to say 10, 15%, at least 25%, right? No. Leaving 2% of total national wealth for the bottom half of the population. 150 something million Americans owning 2% of national wealth. So Piketty, uh, who's also a bit of a historian, marvels at these findings because he says, wow, um, these are similar to feudalism. Um, and he calls this patrimonial capitalism, which is a sort of capitalism where winners and losers tend to have some, or the winners tend to have some connection to pre-existing wealth, to family dynasty, to inheritance, that sort of thing. The myth of the free market rewarding all people on the basis of their intelligence and their effort, myth, right? Yeah. Um, so Piketty says, you don't get these levels of inequality, which are essentially feudal and tend to lead to violent revolutions historically, you don't tend to get these levels of inequality unless they're created on purpose. And they're created on purpose by law and policy, which is what establishes an inequality regime, which is then justified by an ideology. Because human beings, as uh, the only species with a reflective consciousness that I know of need to justify our way of life as good. And if we can't justify it, we're going to feel depressed, alienated, 
or longing for something else, we'll move, we'll join a different club, a different religion, a different political ideology, whatever. So an inequality regime has law, policy, institutions, and an ideology, and they all serve to maximize wealth for the few. Now, that sounds really abstract, I think, until you get to the gentlemen on the right, who are Mar uh, Marty Gillens and Benjamin Page. These are two political scientists, and they also published a study in 2014, and that study showed essentially that Piketty's claims about levels of inequality being on purpose are absolutely true. And what, what, he, what, what they would mean by on purpose is that politicians do not respond to the demands of average citizens. They, in a categorical and systematic way, respond to the demands and preferences of wealthy individuals, interest groups, and corporations. And they claim to establish this empirically in an analysis of over 2,000 issue areas at the federal level. Um, it's an interesting paper to read, but the bottom line conclusion is that Piketty's intuition about inequality being a political phenomenon, that level of inequality at least, is true because the wealthy get what they want in law and policy. So, so far the, in, the intuition is holding true. Um, so then, how is it that the wealthy get so much independent influence over law and policy in the United States? Gillens and Page say, well, it's campaign spending, it's lobbying, partly it's electoral rules and some technicalities, it's voting rights violations, but largely it's control of the electoral and policy-making apparatus by moneyed interests. That's their, their conclusion in the study. So, um, what did I do with my clicker? So how do they do that? Um, that's a good place for it. Great, so um, what Gillens and Page say is absolutely backed up in what we know about campaign donations in the United States, where the top figure, one billion, is the, about the average amount needed now to run a successful presidential campaign. You need to raise about a billion dollars to prevail. Uh, Trump and Clinton both raised, uh, Clinton a little more, Trump a little less, than a, but right there around the $1 billion mark. $11 million, I think it's gone up to 13 now, is about the average price for a successful run for the Senate. Um, 1.5 for the House of Representatives. And um, it's not just your campaign finance, it's also sort of who is supporting you once you win. So once Trump won in 2016, 48 people, or, and also natural persons as well, or legal persons as well, corporations, donated a million dollars or more. So there's this kind of private marketplace for political futures, if you will. And it's a smart investment. There's a lot of studies that track that as well, lobbying expenditures, campaign donations, and they tend to find a very high return on investment, just like any other market that you'd want to invest in. Um, and so uh, the other component to this besides funding campaigns is outside spending. So this is money that's not explicitly coordinated with a campaign or a party, but that an individual interest group or corporation spends of their own accord to broadcast their own message in the media marketplaces that would affect an electoral outcome or a policy making outcome. So these are individuals and interest groups trying to influence outcomes, but not through campaigns or through political parties, rather through outside spending. And those sums are also really, really large. They're going into the billion dollar um, range. And uh, when you look at who gives that money, it's incredibly unequal and stratified along socioeconomic lines. So much like the donors to Trump's inauguration, you've got here 200 millionaires and billionaires standing behind about 80% of all the money spent um, in 2016. Now, um, so democracy becomes in the United States a market for political investors, and here's the total percentage of the adult population that they represent. So, I would urge you, you know, when you read Max's book and you look at the figures of on wealth inequality and income inequality in New Zealand to consider how many people can afford to finance political campaigns and political parties in New Zealand. Well, you know, it's kind of a trick question because so much of it is, is anonymous that you can't really answer that question very easily in New Zealand. Over half of the money is totally opaque that goes to political parties anyhow. Um, but if you did the math, I don't know if it would be quite this extreme. So this, this slide says 
when you look at the great majority on the top here, the donors 0.4%, the great majority of funds that go to political parties and political campaigns, look say 66%, 70% or so of those funds are controlled by 0.4% of the US population. When you look at the money spent by these large independent expenditure groups, it's actually just sort of an astronomically small percentage of the general population that controls those funds. Similar figures for lobbyists. Who are these people? Well, that's what I'd like to know in New Zealand. Because I know who they are in the United States because we have way better disclosure laws than you do. Um, but so in the United States, I can tell you who they are. Well, they're 70% male. They're 84% college educated. They're mostly relatively wealthy as, of course, to have that kind of expendable income. You have to make at least $100,000 or more a year. They're 99% white. Um, this is a major issue for all of these social movements looking for equality, for migrants, for African Americans, for gays and lesbians. You name your group, they're not the donor class. The donor, for women, the, the, so the donor class is this demographic, and yet none of these characteristics sums up the donor class as well as the final characteristic, which is, drum roll, if you're thinking about laws and policies that would concentrate wealth in a small class of people, the main characteristic of the donor spender class is their conservative economic views on law and policy. What the donor and spender class want are the things that increase wealth for their demographic. They're primarily rational in that self-interested way, not in the enlightened sense of rational. <laughs> They're primarily rational in that self-interested way, um, and the evidence suggests that they get what they pay for. All right? Um, now, how does this relate to Trump? Um, I don't want to go way over my time frame, so I'm just going to talk through it instead of showing you the fun pictures of um, Clinton and Trump. You look through their demographics, who voted for Clinton and who voted for Trump. So the Democratic more liberal, more progressive party, and their candidate, their candidate always wins among people who hold PhDs, always wins among African Americans, always wins among those who don't explicitly identify with a particular religion, wins with urban voters. We know that story. But what was special about, what, what, about 2016, what was so special about that election is that Hillary Clinton lost the vote of people who were doing worse this year than the year before. She lost the vote of those people who said life for the next generation of Americans is going to be worse than life for my generation of Americans. In other words, she lost the vote of people who were experiencing decline, typically economic decline, and people who were predicting further decline typically further job loss, further decreases in salaries. It's supposed to be the Democratic Party that responds to those conditions, but what Hillary Clinton had done in a, in a highly unstrategic, really idiotic move, was to give a bunch of lucrative speeches at, on Wall Street to the tune of hundreds of millions of dollars in the lead up to the election. Of course, to be associated with her husband, hard for her to avoid that, but her name is associated with trade liberalization and these trade treaties that Trump was chest thumping about, saying this is where all the jobs in the Midwest went. You know, the reason that there's this decline of heavy industry in the United States is because all the jobs were shipped off. That's because of trade liberalization. Clinton's name is synonymous with that. You'd think it was the Democratic Party that would, well, that would capture the needed change vote, but actually Trump got about 83% of voters whose priority was economic loss, economic hardship, making the country, quote, great again, right? That plays back into our, our data on economic inequality increasing. It plays back into our data on inequality tied to your pre-existing wealth. And it plays back into something that I only vaguely mentioned when I said um, racist, sexist, uh, I think I forgot, I think I left off xenophobic. So how does the illiberal part of Trump relate to these other statistics? Um, if you read uh, Ronald Inglehart, Pippa Norris, political scientists like this, they have very successfully tied this cultural backlash against intellectuals, against uh, migrants, against, against minorities, religious minorities, racial minorities, whatever. They've tied that cultural backlash, that illiberal populism, they've tied it to economic insecurity. When people are feeling insecure economically, 
Their fortunes are insecure, their future is insecure, their jobs are insecure, their industries are insecure. They're primed for that message that someone else is out to get you, to get your job, to take away your way of life, whatever, the Republican message. <laughs> They're primed for it under Trump. So, you know, is New Zealand light years away from that kind of stuff? Not necessarily, because the United States, in the course of just a couple months, went from the first African-American president who was a constitutional law scholar, a democratic organizer, and a very hopeful and optimistic individual. In just a couple months, they went from Barack Obama to Donald Trump. That's like a 180 degree change in a lot of ways. And everyone says, oh, that's unpredictable. Well, not really. When you look at these studies that I've just summarized for you, it's actually not really that unpredictable. It's brimming, it's brewing right under the surface. So when I ask, do you feel secure about the quality of New Zealand's democracy? That's what I mean. Do you feel secure about what's brewing right under the everything's okay surface of things? Now, I have a reason for asking that question in New Zealand. It's not all just speculation. Um, it's not all just what's happened in the United States. It's also, let's see, sorry, there was a lot of material here that I uh, decided not to cover. Um, it's also this kind of thing. Um, so. Of course, you can all find where we are here um, on the map. Uh, what these, the following slides show in red are countries that don't have a certain political finance rule, a rule regarding the financing of political parties and political campaigns. The countries that don't have some of these standard, very important rules are reflected in red. And you'll see New Zealand in red on these rules. Is there a ban on donations from foreign interests? No, uh, but there is a recent $50 limit. Excellent, 2019. Um, is there a ban on donations from foreign interests to candidates? Same thing, they've lowered the limit, good. Um, is there a ban on corporate donations to political parties? Absolutely not. Is there a ban on corporate donations to candidates? Absolutely not. Is there a ban on donations from corporations, even with government contracts to parties or candidates? No, again. New Zealand is vulnerable. Is there a limit on the amount of donations to political parties or candidates? In other words, could I just come along with $5 million and give it to whatever political party I wanted to triple their electoral advertising budget, to triple the events they can hold or what have you? Absolutely. A single person can exercise the democratic power through economic means of hundreds of thousands of New Zealanders with us just write a check. Uh, same thing of donations to candidates, no limit. Um, any rules on lobbyists? You know, is there a register of lobbyists so we know who the, lobby, who the people and the firms doing the lobbying are? Well, it's not mandatory. Um, is there a limitation on whether lobbyists can give donations to campaigns or parties? No. Um, is there a code of conduct for lobbyists? No. So, you know, for all of our confidence in New Zealand democracy, it's essentially a laissez-faire system in many ways. It's a free market for political investors. Um, and, you know, I mean, there's a million reasons to worry about this kind of stuff. The one that I chose to throw up on a slide is the issue of climate change. And, and people think, you know, why is this happening? Why are human beings behaving so irrationally? Well, it's not that public preferences are that irrational on this. It's private preferences that are geared to short-term income, short income and wealth maximization for shareholders over certain quarterly periods. And these organizations that would stand a great deal to lose from emissions limits, uh, from government subsidies to actors who would be redefining how transportation, how heating, how energy is, is harvested, They've, they've outlaid just an incredible amount of money to defeat the sort of legislation and policies that would disadvantage their bottom line. They've done this through lobbying, they've done it through contributions, they've done it through expenditures. Wealth will use whatever avenues are open to it to maximize its returns. It's only natural in the system that we live under. Now, um, <laughs> there's a bunch of SFO investigations going on right now. And it's not even what I'm talking about. It's not even what I'm worried about. 
You've got New Zealand first, right? There's been charges laid against two individuals. We might find out who they are if the name suppression order is lifted tomorrow. It could happen. It would be interesting to know if they're former members of the party or what have you, former MPs, members of the party director. It would be very interesting to know. Um, what have they done? Well, they've established this foundation which essentially circumvents the rules. It's mostly an issue of disclosure because you're allowed to donate unlimited amounts, but once it's over uh, 15,000 to a party, uh, you've got to know who it is. And if it's over 30,000, you get to know who it is and how much it was immediately. Uh, so it's mostly about avoiding disclosure. Um, national party uh, in investigation has also led to charges being laid. Of course, you've got the mayoral candidates. Um, there's a lot going on in terms of people who have allegedly violated New Zealand's very liberal political financing framework. But my point to you would be, the scandal is not those who have broken these very permissive rules, although that is scandalous. The main scandal is what's legal. The main scandal is that you don't have to break the rules to acquire an unbelievable quantity of influence now. Can I prove that it's there? Not necessarily. But public preferences on the issues that I showed you before, housing, inequality, child poverty, public preferences don't align with the state of affairs in New Zealand today. I wonder why that is. Um, how am I doing on time, Marcus? I feel like I might be five. OK. I might not even need it. Um, what else did I want to bring up for you all? Yeah, OK. Let me just do one other thing. Um, so, so far, I've spent some time on the United States. I spent some time on New Zealand. And that's, you know, that's a, a comparison. And it's an odd comparison in all the, for all the reasons that the United States and New Zealand are very different places to live. Um, however, New Zealand's vulnerabilities and the United States' proven vulnerabilities that have really played out in law policy and, and economic stratification are not anomalous. In other words, to be thinking about these issues and to be wrestling with these, these issues puts us in very, very good company. And this is where I would go back to what I said before about democracy being in decline. Uh, this is a really important moment in history, if we're not confident about the quality of democracy enduring, to be paying attention to economic inequality and political inequality through political finance. Now, why do I say that? Okay, so. Uh, sources on this, the 2017 Economic Intelligence Unit from The Economist cites a broad-based deterioration in the practice of democracy. What are they talking about? A trend of stagnation or regression. Uh, what does that mean? Declining popular participation in elections and politics. Weaknesses in the functioning of government. Dwindling appeal of mainstream parties. Growing influence of unaccountable institutions. And a widening gap between political elites and electorates. That's the economist talking. I'm not reading to you from dissent or the Marxist times or what have you, right? This is fairly standard political liberalism speaking here. Um, another interesting source is the Electoral Integrity Project, which is based at Harvard University and Sydney University. They have reports on, well, the integrity of elections. And its 2019 report reminded people that elections are necessary for liberal democracies but they're far from sufficient for facilitating genuine accountability and public choice. Okay, so what is it about democracies that can fail those of us concerned with genuine accountability and public choice? The 2016 and 29 reports from the Electoral Integrity Project single out the campaign stage of elections, in particular the campaign finance stage, as the weakest one in the electoral cycle in many countries. They say that the most widespread problem facing democracies relates to failed standards of campaign finance, reporting that campaign finance failed to meet international standards in two-thirds of all elections in all the countries they look at, which are over 100 anyway. So this vulnerability in New Zealand is tied up to a rather global vulnerability that is being litigated in the popular sense of the word in countries all over the world. So you know, for it, to the extent New Zealanders are complacent or overconfident about these sorts of things, I think they're doing that um, to, in a way, to, in, to, in, the, in defiance of a general overall realization about what this century is about and whether it's going to be a positive one or not for the issues that we care about. Now, a lot of this, you know, coming to terms with this, I think, relates to the labeling that we put on it. 
So how do we describe the undue influence of wealth? That's what I've been getting at with New Zealand. That's what I've been getting at with the United States. That's what the global reports are describing. How do we understand what that is? What is this undue influence? Um, Transparency International, in his 2019 report, says, finally, it's corruption. Transparency International says, governments must urgently address the corrupting role of big money in political party financing and the undue influence it exerts on our political systems. Um, keeping money out of politics is essential to ensure political decision making serves the public interest and curbs opportunities for corrupt deals. Um, so I'm getting some gestures from Marcus, I need to wrap this up. But that's, that's the final point here that I would say is that to consider these issues now puts us in very good company and actually would be necessary to keep New Zealand in line with its obligations under international treaty and the international treaty on corruption as well. So there's this blind spot here. I'm really hoping to call attention to it. I'm very curious what your views are um, in, the, in the comment and question section. Thanks for your attention. Appreciate it. Well, kia ora koutou, nā mihi nui te pō. Uh, thanks very much, Tim, for that fantastic talk. Thank you very much, everyone, uh, for being here. Thank you to the uh, politicians in the room for attending. Um, thank you very much, Marcus and everyone else, for all the effort you've put into organising this talk. Um, I've come to you today from Wellington, and I thought I would also bring you a picture of Wellington. Um, this is a picture of Porodua. Uh In the foreground, you have the state housing of Cannons Creek. Uh, these are some of the poorest uh, places in New Zealand, and they are also quite literally very geographically at the bottom. Uh, in the background, in the sort of the sunlit uplands, uh, you have the Aotea block, um, which is a relatively new development, um, relatively expensive. At the time uh, it was being developed, sections and houses were selling for in the order of $800,000. Uh, given Wellington house price inflation, probably something like twice that now is what they'd be worth. Um, so a clear story of inequalities, um, but also a, a story of division in the sense that when the Altair block was being developed, there were proposals at one stage to interweave uh, state housing, public housing, into the private developments to create a kind of mixed community, shared community, shared experiences that was deemed not a priority. There was also talk of building transport links between the two communities. Again, not deemed a priority. So that's something to... Uh, to think about and it's an image that I thought reflected the talk that I wanted to give you tonight, a talk that I think dovetails well uh, with what Tim's been talking about and it's a talk that drawing a lot on um, a book called Why Nations Fail uses the metaphor of upwards and downward spirals and spirals that are created between the interaction between our political systems and our economic systems. And broadly speaking, if your political and economic systems are both set up to be inclusive, you're on an upwards self-reinforcing spiral. So if political power is distributed widely, if there's really good participation in your democracy, that tends to lead to a more even distribution of resources through the economy, which in turn facilitates more people to participate in our democratic system and so on and so forth. Conversely, if you have a political system which is relatively extractive, uh, where a small number of people have an undue influence over political power, that tends to create policies that lead to greater economic inequality, which in turn suppresses participation, particularly from poorer people, and so on and so forth. And you're on the downward spiral at that point. Now, I think New Zealand, through a lot of its history, has been, you know, on some kind of variant on the upward spiral. Uh, we're a very imperfect nation, just like all other nations, and marked by serious inequalities. 
uh, particularly those between Māori and Pākehā. But if you look at sort of the long history of the 19th century, you can see increasing democratic participation, led of course by the suffragettes and other campaigners, and increasing economic inequality. You know, politicians built an economic system which was slowly and slowly delivering a more even share of prosperity. The question is, what has been happening in the last 30 to 40 years? Are we still on the upward spiral or not? And uh, while I think Tim is quite right to point out to, to point just how much severe these issues are in America, I think we are also starting to be on the downward spiral in New Zealand. A couple of little images uh, to make this point, again on a housing theme. Um, this is a, a picture of a place I stayed in, in uh, some time ago in Wellington um, and wrote about for the listener. It's a boarding house. Uh, it's a private establishment that puts up people who are in very desperate straits who would otherwise be homeless and in doing so exploits them. Uh, this place was just as bad as it looks. It was dirty, damp, cold, mouldy. Uh, the windows weren't even properly sealed, so it leaked when it rained. Um, there were very few communal facilities. And um, at the time, and this is seven years ago, seven or eight years ago, uh, I was still paying $150 a week. Uh, cash in hand, no bond, no uh, tenancy agreement, probably no tax paid either, I had a guess. Um, at the other end of the spectrum, uh, this was at the time the most expensive house ever built in New Zealand, um, Auckland's Paritai Drive, built for the now disgraced financier Mark Hotchin. So, a little visual contrast there. Um, and, of course, there are numbers behind these contrasts. If we look at what has happened to incomes, what has happened to income inequality in New Zealand in the last 30 to 40 years, how has that distribution of income become unbalanced? One of the ways we can tell that story is by looking at the fortunes of four typical people in New Zealand, as marked on the right-hand side. In the start, it goes back to 1982, forward through into a few years ago, and it's people's incomes adjusted for inflation, and for the first three lines I'm going to show you, it's their after-tax income which is what determines people's spending power. And the sad reality is that for the poorest tenth of New Zealanders in the last 30 to 40 years, the increase in their incomes in that time has been that. Uh, almost, almost a negligible amount. It's gone from probably about $12,000 a year after tax to about $14,000 a year. So very, very little increase. And if you took into account housing costs, which have risen so much in that time, the poorest New Zealanders actually have less disposable income than they did in the mid-1980s. You start to see, though, why we talk about inequality and not just poverty, because incomes for the typical single person in New Zealand have also not increased much in the last 30 to 40 years. They've gone from maybe $27,000 a year after tax to about $35,000 a year after tax. So the picture you start to see emerging is one in which the decisions that politicians have taken have created an economic system in which most of the rewards, the extra growth, the extra prosperity, are bypassing not just the poorest New Zealanders, but to a substantial extent also middle New Zealanders. In contrast, incomes for someone in the richest 10% have doubled in that time, from about $60,000 a year to about $120,000 a year. And incomes for the richest 1%, this is their pre-tax income. It comes, you have to take it from a different data set, so it's not strictly comparable to the bottom three lines, but just for illustrative purposes. You can see the incomes of the 1% really taking off at the same time. Nor are these things unconnected. Um, for reasons of time, I won't go through all the details, but the incomes of the richest New Zealand and the incomes of the poorest New Zealanders are, I think, intimately linked. Just one connection that I'll mention. 
back in the 80s, at the start of all of this, before we had what was incidentally the world's biggest increase, developed world's biggest increase in inequality, mid 80s to mid 2000s. Before then, about 60% of company revenue on average went to frontline staff, went to workers, uh, and about 40% went to the owners of the businesses. Since then, that balance has shifted enormously to the point where the share of company revenue going to staff has declined from 60% to 50% with a commensurate increase in the share that goes to the owners of businesses. That falling share is very significant. If the share going to staff of company revenue had stayed at 60%, the average wage in New Zealand right now would be $12,000 higher than it is. And so that's, that's one way in which these things are connected because the power balance has shifted within companies because it's much harder to, uh, well, far fewer people are members of trade unions, for instance, because the laws around collective bargaining have changed. Far more income is going to people at the upper end with a corresponding loss in income to average and poorer New Zealanders. So that's a sort of an indication that we're on a bit of a downward spiral in terms of equality, economic equality in New Zealand. Um, on top of that inequality of income, which I just showed you, that's the inequality of salaries and wages and things, benefits. Uh, there's also inequality of wealth in terms of the inequality of the things that we own, the assets we have, or for a large number of people, the debts, principally, that they have. And this is a visualization that I worked on with Toby Morris from the spin-off. Um, and it sort of shows you the wealth in New Zealand metaphorically is a 10-storey building. And you sort of say, well, if all the wealth in New Zealand was a 10-storey building, who would own what proportion of this building? And as you can see, um, the wealthiest 1%, and that's about 40,000 adults in New Zealand, have a fifth of all the wealth. Uh, so they would have two storeys all to themselves in this metaphorical building. Um, as Marcus alluded to earlier, when you widen that out to include the rest of the wealthiest 10%, um, you're about six uh, stories down by that stage, about 60% of all the wealth in the wealthiest 10%. The next 40%, and that's sort of that's the middle classes in a sense, have an exactly equal share of wealth. Basically, they have about 40% of it, which is all well and good until you realise that that means the poorest half of the country, so that's, you know, two million adults, uh, have just 2% of all the country's wealth. Uh, many of them are, well, between them, the very poorest New Zealanders are billions of dollars in debt. Uh, and so in this notional 10-storey building, they would be crammed into about half of the bottom floor. So very significant inequalities of wealth. That's a bit of a... Uh, ah, yes. Sorry, and that's right. And that's one thing I wanted to mention in terms of the consequences of this. Um, again, I could talk for a long time about the consequences of this economic inequality, but just one thing that I wanted to focus on. It's a pretty basic principle uh, that there should be equal opportunities. It's something genuinely, generally, everyone believes in. Kids starting out in life should have an equal chance of success, of fulfilling their dreams, of being economically prosperous. Um, the problem is that runs head on into very wide economic inequalities. After all, if you have very big economic differences between rich and poor, children will get completely different starts in life. And I know this as someone who had a very fortunate start in life, growing up in Eastbourne, one of the wealthier parts of the country, had all kinds of advantages that my parents gave me that were clearly not on offer to children growing up in Cannons Creek. And as a result of that, you see things like the fact that in the US, half of your income as an adult can be predicted from what your parents earned. In other words, half of your economic success has nothing to do with the choices that you make. It is essentially predetermined, um, you know, except for the, the choice of having chosen the right parents. Um, conversely, in Denmark, which is very egalitarian, there's not a huge imbalance between rich and poor, one-fifth of your income can be predicted from who your parents were. So there's some transmission of advantage and disadvantage 
but it's pretty minimal. In New Zealand, uh, about 20 years ago, our figure for that was measured at one third, so somewhere between those two. But given that, you know, the greater your inequality and the effects of that inequality, the stronger that effect is going to be of that sort of unfair transmission of advantage and disadvantage across generations, I would think that our figure is probably worsening and heading more towards the US one. Again, consistent with what Tim was saying. So very severe and growing, to some extent, inequalities of income and wealth, and therefore of opportunity, on the economic front, combined with a democratic story also of declining participation in some senses. Now, I don't think that voting is the be-all and end-all. In fact, I'm going to talk in a moment about why um, I don't think it is. But it is still of concern that we have, broadly speaking, declining voter turnout in New Zealand. Or certainly it's declined since the 1980s. Um, obviously, it's been a little bit higher in the last couple of elections, and that's really encouraging but it's still well down from its peak. Um, and the other thing to point out is this is voter turnout as a percentage of enrolled voters. And of course, increasingly large numbers of people are not even enrolled. So the figures are even worse in a sense than they're shown here. So it does look, I mean, you don't want to exaggerate things. I think we still do a lot of things well in New Zealand, um, but it does look as if we are on a bit of a downward spiral in that sense. Um, and that's not a particularly cheerful prospect, um, but because I always think it's a bit of a, um, it's, it's not much fun to turn up and just talk about how terrible everything is without sending people away with just a little spark of hope, um, I wanted to offer up a few solutions uh, to conclude on. Um, this is going to be a bit of a whistle-stop tour through some of the ideas, um, but I hope to give you a flavour at least of some of the things that I think are on the table. So addressing the economic uh, inequality part of things first, um, what are a few of the things that I would do, you know, uh, where I in charge, in order to address inequality in New Zealand? Um, I mean, obviously, you'd need, you know, dozens and dozens of policies, but, you know, this is a, this is a short list. Um, one of the first things I would do is focus massively on the redeployment of people um, across the workforce, uh, you know, particularly thanks to coronavirus, but just generally as technology accelerates and other things, we have increasingly large numbers of people losing their jobs. Now, there will be new jobs, at least for the next couple of decades, out there for those people, but they won't have the skills they need to fit those new jobs. So I think as a society, we need it to put a huge effort behind the kinds of programs that take people, look at what their skills are, look at where they need to get to, to fill those new jobs, and then give them the training that they need to make that shift. So not mass unemployment, but mass redeployment is the issue we face there, I think. Of course, once, even assuming once you get people into work, uh, it's, that's not much use if they're not being well paid, if they're not getting a fair share of the revenue that their company generates. So I'd like to see things picked up much more like pay ratios. You know, the idea that you should set some fixed kind of ratio between how much the highest earner gets in your company and how much the lowest earner gets. Because that doesn't stop you paying well for talent. It doesn't stop you paying well at the upper end if you feel that's required. It just says if you're going to do that, you have to lift everybody else's wages as well. Because company success ultimately is a team endeavour the company's doing well, everyone should do well off the back of it. Um, I think that even with uh, investment in mass redeployment, much better training programs, there will still, of course, always be people on benefits. And while they're trying to get themselves back on their feet, while they're trying to work out what it is that they want to do in terms of wider social contribution, I think they should be able to lead a life of dignity and participation in the society to which they contribute. So I think benefits should be set at a much more livable level than they are on currently. Um, obviously, we need to fix the housing market. That kind of goes without saying, although it is, of course, easier to say than to do. Um, I don't have all the answers there, 
One thing I would note is that we currently have the same number of state houses in New Zealand as we had in the early 1990s, even though the population has grown immensely since then. Um, although it is good to see the current government accelerating the building of state houses. Um, if we, you know, if building had kept up with just the increase in population since the 1990s, we'd have something like another 20,000 state homes, uh, which would be enough to house all of the 40,000 odd people who were found to be homeless in New Zealand at the last census. So that's something to think about. Um, Lastly, we know that in New Zealand, um, if you look at IRD research, for instance, when they um, investigate the uh, tax affairs of the very wealthiest New Zealanders, those with over $50 million each, they find that in any given year, roughly half of those people who have more than $50 million are declaring less than $70,000 in taxable income. So they're not even top tax rate payers. Now, this is clearly impossible. I mean, no one who has $50 million is generating less than $70,000 in terms of the return on that. What they are doing is finding all sorts of ways to minimise their tax obligations. Um, they take a lot of their income as capital gains, which, of course, aren't taxed. They generate losses, whether real or on paper, to count against their future tax payments, which, of course, is what Donald Trump has been doing for decades, as we know, thanks to the New York Times reportings. Um, they undervalue the services that they provide to their company in order to take less income that would be taxed as income, again, in order to take more capital gains. And according to the IRD, um, they make quite a lot of donations to charities which they control, in which then, in the IRD's words, appear to make few or no charitable uh, donations. So there's a real issue, I think, with... Most of us who earn incomes, paying tax pretty diligently on every cent that we earn, and other people feeling like they're able to avoid those obligations. And so I think we need a real crackdown on that. Finally, just to close, I also wanted to talk about some of the solutions on the democratic front. And again, these are many and varied. Um, but just on a simple level, I would make a big push for enhancing the ability of citizens to participate meaningfully and intelligently in the core business of democracy, in making decisions. Some of you may be familiar with the ladder of citizen participation, uh, which is basically a measure of how deeply our citizens engaged in democracy from the lowest rung of the ladder, which is, is called therapy, um, which I think is just trying to make citizens feel better about everything, um, through to the point where citizens are actually genuinely creating, co-creating policies with their elected representatives, with councillors, with MPs. You've really got people in the room helping take the big decisions. But I don't think just giving people that power is enough because what's to say that the results of that will be intelligent? What's to say that citizens will use it well? Because, of course, that's not a given. And so I tend to think about things as a dual ladder because you also want to lift people up the ladder of what's technically called deliberation, which just means high-quality public discussion. You know, and again, you can go through from your classic sort of government consultation, which, best case, sort of just as people individually, in an isolated fashion, giving their views, through to things like, say, citizens' assemblies, where you get you know, 100 representative people brought together and trained and given time and encouraged to listen to each other and think deeply and reflect on their positions and then deliver a sort of set of consensus recommendations that reflect what people really want. In those kinds of situations, because people have the chance to, dis to discuss things intelligently with each other, you're really bringing to the surface the wisdom of the crowd. So the, the participation empowers the crowd and deliberation ensures that what it comes up with is intelligent. Now that's a huge subject which I don't have time to delve into properly, but I just think that if we could find ways for people to be much more meaningfully engaged in the basic practice of democracy, we would start to move back on the upward spiral in terms of where New Zealand's heading as a country that in turn would be reinforced 
by greater economic equality in terms of the things that I talked about before, and hopefully then we would really be in a, on a reinforcing spiral back to making or remaking New Zealand as the really special place that Tim alluded to. Thank you very much. Right. <laughs> Now's your opportunity to have some questions. Um, I won't rave around with the mic. Um, rather, if you can speak loudly, I will uh, repeat the questions. So I'm sure we've got some questions there. Someone from Mackenzie Elwin must have a question lined up for either Tim or Max. Um, we've got till roughly seven o'clock, so we, we can have a few. So don't be shy. Did they floor you? Maria. Question for Max. I'd like to understand a bit more about how that could work in practice. So are you talking about a direct democracy approach for Switzerland or a version of that? And if so, how does the minority voice get into the practice? So the question is about direct democracy and how the minority voice gets heard. Max, uh, could it ask to explain how that might work in practice? Yeah, no thanks. It's a really good question and I was skipping over things pretty quickly. Um, I'm not in favour of direct democracy if the term is used to mean referendums and that kind of thing. I'm not totally against referendums, um, but you know they involve people participating deeply, right? But there's no guarantee that anybody who votes in a referendum has thought about their vote at any point. And indeed, you know, Brexit uh, may <laughs> suggests that, that that is a very real problem, I think. I mean, not, not just because even if you agree or disagree with the result, but just very clearly in terms of people's comprehension of the issue. So, no, I mean, I wouldn't lean very heavily on referenda because I don't think they're intelligent, they're not deliberative um, in the technical terms. I'm much more excited about things like citizens' assemblies, um, a lot of things that work well at the local council level, because you know I do think that people are experts in their own lives. Subject matter expertise is really important, but people are expert in their own lives, and they're most expert in terms of what is going on in their local area. So things like participatory budgeting, um, you know, where residents are directly involved in allocating parts of council budgets, things like crowdsourced legislation, um, things like sort of rapid online, deep sort of deliberative processes, um, which other countries have used to deal with, you know, Uber, for instance. I think there's a whole suite of tools, but they do have to involve people discussing things really intelligently with each other, or else I don't think they're a, a major step forward, and in fact they can be dangerous in some cases. Oh, sorry, and, just, and on the, the minority question, which I mean is of course one of the problems with referenda, in things like citizens' assemblies, you know, they're sampled to be representative of the whole population. And you, I mean, you can actually oversample for people from poorer backgrounds, for instance, if you really want to boost that voice. And, the, and those sorts of things, the facilitation is key, you know, because a, well, a poorly moderated discussion makes people more extreme and is dominated by very confident people. Uh, like myself, uh, a well-facilitated discussion makes sure that all voices are heard and that everyone feels comfortable participating. Mr McKinley, I might actually have to come to you. I'll try and see if I can allow it. Well, yeah, I think everybody can hear Peter. <laughs> so. The issue that needs to be discussed <coughs> is who takes the lead in breaking down the system that we currently have and moving towards a more participatory approach. We have probably the most centralised government in the Western world, becoming more centralised and more top-down if you look at current public policy changes in a number of areas. If you listen to people in local government, you'll be told generally that most councils are management controlled and that elected members are typically sidelined in terms of any significant influence. So what you see is a picture of a very tight, if you will, monopoly over the exercise of governance. 
and nobody within the systems of control, either central government or local government, with any incentives or apparent interest in opening up to the kind of vision that you, I think, quite rightly set out. So for me, the question is not what's the vision that matters, but who implements it and how? Yeah, so it, it's a very good question. I mean, it's one thing to have a vision, um, but you have to know how to get there. Um, look, it, it, it's really difficult. I mean, and, and you have more experience than I do, um, in fact, in trying to uh, bring these sorts of changes about. I, I think that there's a couple of potential... I think any route in is going to probably have to be small scale and experimental and sort of piloting things because I think there's a lot of scepticism out there about the stuff that I'm talking about, as you know. And in some ways, you know, that scepticism will over, only be overcome by actually doing it, you know, by doing it, by doing these different ways, finding these different ways of doing democracy and then showing people that it works. And that'll probably mean small scale experimenting with stuff. I, I also think... I mean, I, I understand why politicians are sceptical um, and council staff are sceptical about these things. I, I think we, and I include myself in this, probably need to make a better pitch, which is about short-term pain for long-term gain. Now, of course, humans are famously bad at making that trade-off, as anyone knows who's avoided going to the gym uh, when they really should. But it is absolutely true that you know doing democracy differently does involve some people, including politicians, giving up some of their decision-making rights in the short term. But the long-term benefit is really clear because, in, in, and you'll know this, you know, the evidence tells us that when people take part in citizens' assemblies and participatory budgeting and stuff, they come out of it with much greater trust in the system because the system is working differently, because there's actually, they're actually taking part, they're having a meaningful influence. So, you know, you survey people and afterwards they have a higher opinion of politicians, they have a higher opinion of government, they have higher trust in the direction of policies generally. And so I think it's being able to say to people, look, you know, local councils, like everyone else, other politicians, have a face a crisis of trust. I think here is a way of long-term restoring that trust. You just have to, in the short term, maybe just have a slightly more relaxed attitude to power. Go out the back. Can you? Look, I'm hoping it's. Uh, I'm hoping what I'm going to ask is um, appropriate. Uh, Jacinta Ardern um, at the Goalkeepers at the United Nations last year, at the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, uh, she she said that she's going to take New Zealand into Agenda 2030, which is communism, and we didn't vote for that. And I want to know whether that's treason. Can I say before um, either Tim or Max uh, answer that question that actually, um, I don't know that those sort of labels are particularly helpful, but actually what you've heard about tonight is actually about making capitalism for the many, not the few. Okay? That's, my, that's, that's a lot of what we're talking about is actually getting capitalism back to where it used to be, producing wide broad benefits for many people, not a few people, who gain the system for their own advantage. So um, I don't think applying labels like communist is particularly helpful. Sorry, I didn't want to cut your question off. Um, I'll give these guys a chance to answer that. Um, I'm sorry, but what you're talking about is a conspiracy theory that has absolutely no merit whatsoever. I'd like both uh, to comment on where you see the, the media, both uh, social media and traditional media, being able to, what we demand from society of media to help progress New Zealand in the directions you would suggest, and 
I look at America and see where perhaps the media has been part of the problem that's, that's driven them to the polarisation that they're in. Where do you see the media helping New Zealand in the future? Um, yeah, I think it's a really good question um, and was something that I probably neglected a bit in my talk. Obviously, the role of the media is crucial. I think the, I think the media have been going through a tough time in the last couple of decades. Um, and I mean that partly in a sympathetic way, partly not. Um, I mean, I should say that I am or have been a journalist. Um, so, you know, I'm not sort of neutral on all of this. Um, you know, the problems are well worn that the old, the old model of funding journalism disappeared um, with the internet and they didn't, news organisations didn't realise that the rivers of gold, classified advertising, that sort of thing, were going to disappear and were really caught napping. And so they've been in a long period of decline. Um, you look at the numbers of journalists and it's, you know, it's halved in the last couple of decades, I think. Um, and some of them, I think this can be exaggerated, but some of them got caught in that trap of, okay, we need to try to boost our uh, viewership or readership or whatever, what do people like? People like clickbait, so on and so forth. Um, and that's just quite a negative, that's another negative spiral. But, but I, think it, I think it has been a period of unrest and disruption rather than terminal decline or anything like that. And I look at the things that are springing up now and I'm cautiously optimistic about that. So you've got things like Newsroom, you know, a completely new outfit online has found a, a viable model to deliver really serious, detailed journalism. I mean, covering pretty nuts and bolts policy stuff. You know, really serious reporting, great investigative reporting. Um, you've got the spin-off, also a new online model, does great commentary, reflects the diversity of New Zealand really well, which incidentally the old media didn't do at all. Um, and then you've got things like, I mean, just in the last couple of days, a fantastic stuff circuit documentary about Billy Tekahika Jr. And, um, you know, the extent to which he's enriching himself from this supposed noble crusade that he's on. So actually there is some fantastic stuff out there. Um, I think the new models are beginning to work. Um, I think we could do more. I think we massively under, under invest in public interest journalism and public broadcasting in New Zealand and it's heartening to see quite a few parties, I would say probably the majority of serious parties at this election promising you know, digital service tax, a public interest journalism fund, all these kinds of things. So I think in, you know, in 10 years of time or something like that I'm optimistic that we'll have a stronger public media and a more thriving private sector media as well. Just to add something briefly on social media, um, I hate to always be the bearer of bad news, but mostly what I see with social media are, the again, the dangers. Um, the US election in 2016 was a really interesting and extreme example of that. When there's a man with an assault rifle, you may have heard of Pizzagate, who raided the, looking for the basement of this pizza restaurant because he was under the uh, false impression that John Podesta and Hillary Clinton were running a child sex trafficking ring. And so this man actually burst into this restaurant with uh, an assault weapon attempting to liberate children who had been enslaved by the Democratic Party. Um, and this was a piece of fake news that had been intentionally cultivated and launched to discredit the Democratic uh, party. Uh, I would also, you know, besides fake news, you've got the deep fakes, of course, in the pipeline where there's modified video footage that appears to be real but is in fact um, fabricated, uh, personal data theft, Cambridge Analytica, that sort of thing, biased algorithms, the echo chamber. I mean, when I think of social media, I was really hoping for grassroots politics. I was really hoping for an alternative to the profit-driven, uh, privatized media that is, you know, so polarizing in many countries where it takes root, and so reinforcing as well of economic uh, inequalities because they don't want to shed light on systemic inequalities that would alienate their advertising base. Surprise, surprise, right? You just go back to Noam Chomsky and manufacturing consent, that sort of thing, and the profit model. So I was hoping social media would prove to be an experiment in grassroots um, and egalitarian kinds of democratic activity, but in fact it 
to my mind, it looks mostly like science fiction. And of course, the science fiction is creeping in again because of the profit model, where people's attention has become the commodity. So that's deeply, deeply disturbing. Again, uh, the United States, Russia, uh, many other large countries have been uh, sort of scary case studies for how these disinformation campaigns and algorithms are used to undermine elections. So I think in New Zealand, I'd be thinking partly, of course, about empowering people to be critical users of these platforms, critical thinkers, but also I would be thinking about regulating them and probably breaking up Facebook, Twitter, et cetera. I was having a look at the growth in those wealth statistics and reflecting back quite a few years to the time where we all thought we were subject to all sorts of oppressive regimes. And I won't make any comparison um, to Robert Muldoon to any sort of current leadership discussions that are had. But back in those days, we had um, the Estate and Gift Duties Act. We had land tax. We had gift duty. We had Land Settlement Promotion Acquisition Acts, all which had a moderating influence on some of those things. Yet many of us at the time, some not even born in this room, but some of us under 40, saw them as also very oppressive in terms of their impact. But when you look at those statistics, you, know, you wonder whether in fact the removal of the, some of those has had, had a significant impact on those. Uh, well, factors. So I'm just interested in a comment on that, and obviously, from an American perspective, it may not be possible. But you know, what is the impact of something like capital gains tax in the state and in the states in terms of levelling those sorts of things off? Yeah, I, th I think it's a really good point, and you know, a lot of those taxes that you allude to. Um, would be incredibly unpopular now. Um, I mean, I find it fascinating. I think, you know, the moral argument for an in, for some kind of inheritance tax is so strong because inheritance is the mo are the most unjust form of wealth. Um, and I think you could absolutely allow, you know, small levels of inheritance without any tax, but then start to tax the larger ones. And indeed, the U.S., you know, vastly unequal U.S. has an estate tax. The U.K. has an inheritance tax. Um, but they're, they're very unpopular. Um, and there's probably lots of reasons for that, and that's partly shifting ideologies. But I do think your broad point is very well made. And in a funny way, I feel like we've never got the balance right in New Zealand. I mean, and probably no country ever has. Um, you know, we were a much more egalitarian country in terms of income and wealth up to the mid 80s. But we're also a very, you know, closeted, closeted, protected society. Um, I don't need to tell you about, you know, how difficult it was, you know, even to get magazines into New Zealand and, you, yeah, 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 you know, you were, you were limited in how much cash you could take overseas. You had to tell the authorities, you know, how much it was. The New Zealand manufacturers were incredibly protected. And generally, I think there was a suspicion, I mean, not that I was alive, but from reading, but there was a suspicion of difference a suspicion of innovation, a suspicion of diversity. And so I think the greater economic inequality, uh, greater economic equality of that period has got tarnished by association. It is seen as, you know, wanting greater equality is seen as being about conformity and putting a lid on talent and putting a lid on difference and diversity and innovation. Now, you know, things are much freer and we're a much more dynamic country in a lot of ways but we let go of the equality at the same time. And the really tricky thing is, well, how do we get the balance right in the future? You know, how do we get greater economic equality so that there are those genuinely equal opportunities, but without the sort of the leveling down and putting the cap on aspiration that I think a lot of people hear in the back of their minds when people like me say, oh, we need less economic inequality. So I think that's about thinking, well, what does fairness in the future mean? Not harking back to some sort of mystical golden age. What does it mean in the future? How does, how does greater equality and fairness act in the service of unleashing all that talent and diversity and innovation that is currently stifled by the lack of equal opportunities? Really complex, but I think your point's very well made. I would just add that 
beyond the highly controversial question, right, of what the optimal tax rates would be in these different categories, I think there's a much less controversial issue, which would be to clamp down on tax avoidance, which is something that, that Max mentioned in his talk. I mean, I would try to elevate the status of things like the Panama Papers, you know, these leaked documents that demonstrate how especially high net worth individuals, uh, money launderers, corrupt uh, deals, trading and influence, uh, conflicts of interest, how people who benefit from these things are able to hide their wealth, um, how they're able to use banking secrecy laws, uh, to hide their wealth, to hide corrupt transactions. I would clamp down on the stuff that borders on the illegal and the, let's say, disloyal to your, to your country kind of thing. I would, I would focus on tax avoidance, banking secrecy, tax havens, um, and that sort of stuff. In terms of the really controversial side, I'd just be looking for experimentation to find that optimal level that still keeps people's incentives in play, right? That you still have an incentive to work hard, to innovate, to, to do that, to create. Um, but you can avoid producing these massive social externalities, uh, these cycles of poverty, um, the homelessness, the sorts of things that are ultimately not in anyone's enlightened economic self-interest anyway. It just gets into a point of social decay, which is not good for capitalism if that's your main concern. I'm conscious we're running out of time. Um, one more question. No, my wife's rounding out me. She's telling me to... <laughs> We do have a few more minutes. Um, you, you, uh, <laughs> if you're all desperate to go, you can go. <laughs> um, who's been waiting? <laughs> I'll go over here. Just a brief one. You've uh, painted quite a bleak picture. Uh, of our challenges, but you did refer to Denmark. Are there any simple cyst political system changes that we might learn from there? Some good news, please. <laughs> well, I'll give you some good news while I walk back. Is that um, young people inspire me with uh, some of the things they're doing in this space, and uh, we'll talk about that in a moment. They'll let these guys answer that question. I, I think there's a lot of lessons to be learned from somewhere like Denmark, but a lot, a lot of what they do is sort of is the big picture, gnarly stuff that is quite difficult under New Zealand sort of current cultural settings. Um, so what do they do? Well, you know, they have a top tax rate, which I think is 55% on the highest incomes. Um, they also tax capital gains, I'm pretty sure. Um, they have all kinds of things. Um, they have very high trade union uh, coverage of the workplace, up around 70%, I think. Um, you know, and it really is those big picture drivers that change things. I guess the one thing that maybe we're learning from is they also have a model that they call flex security for their welfare system. So they have a very flexible uh, labor market. It's relatively easy to hire and fire people in Denmark. But the security part is they say, well, when you lose your job, there will be very generous benefits. So, you know, we'll give you that, that kind of security, that stable base. So initially the benefit in Denmark uh, would replace something like 70% of the average wage if you're a single person. Um, in New Zealand, it's about half that. Uh, and that sort of higher benefit in Denmark tapers off over time. Um, it's a bit like the COVID relief payment that the government introduced here. Uh, but it helps people cushion the, the shock of job loss. It helps them keep things together. It helps them hang on to their house while they get back on their feet. And the Danes also have really good retraining programs and they throw a lot of money at them. Um, so that basically, it's not about keeping people attached to their jobs, but it's about keeping people attached to work as a general concept, and it's, and it's very effective. And I feel like we might be starting to pick up some of those things in New Zealand. So this isn't about Denmark specifically, but there's, uh, I think it's good news to my mind that there is an emerging consensus on the requirements or the ingredients of democratic integrity. 
And there's this general, just as after the fall of the Berlin Wall, there was sort of this spread of capitalist democracy, right, that made people pretty euphoric for a while, but then turned out to be radically incomplete in terms of generating all these inequalities and so on. Well, I would say there, there's sort of another um, stage of globalization happening, a sort of you know, third or fourth wave of globalization that concerns the standards for political integrity. Um, I think it's good news that when you look to the Council of Re Europe, you can see the Venice Commission, this constitutional advisory body, coming up with a list of recommendations for keeping uh, political responsiveness and represent representation in check, which has to do with donation limits, some expenditure limits, some public financing for parties, but not too much so that they exclude their challengers. Um, not too much so that they become dependent on the state and insensitive to their constituents' demands, but that there's a sweet, excuse me, a sweet spot there. Um, not only the Venice Commission and the Council of Europe, but the OECD, um, the Office of Democratic Institutions and Human Rights, has a set of guidelines on this, the Human Rights Committee at the UN, and a really rich comparative law liter literature that shows the differing results of experimentation along these lines. But I, I do think there's a movement now for democratic integrity that leadership um, and the general public can choose to gravitate towards. It's just a question of how salient the issue is. Um, so for my, to my mind, there's sort of a cause for hope in thinking that there could be a next generation of political activism and political, um, well, social movements really, aimed at making the democratic form completing it, finishing it, making it what it's supposed to be. Um, and I think there's a lot of information now and networks to draw from there. So I don't think we're alone in caring about these issues. Uh, I, I think we need to finish now, but I'd just like to finish with some thanks, first of all, to Tim and Max. Uh, Tim uh, gave us an interesting start, and he came here as a time traveler. And I was hoping to read something from his, his book because uh, you'll enjoy reading it. Um, if you enjoyed his description of Donald Trump, there's even more of that in here. Uh, and Max, I think, encouraged us to get back to the upward spiral on our, our democracy. And uh, much of what we've talked about, I think, and they've heightened for us tonight, is the need that, to get back to what... Max talks about in his book called Government for the Public Good rather than the Private Good. And uh, so I hope you have been challenged. Uh, that was the intention of bringing these gentlemen to our city and uh, that you go away and think deeply about the issues and particularly take on board uh, the challenge that I think both of them have issued, which is to not be complacent um, about a paradise because there are warning signs and danger signs and we have obviously uh, a system that is exposed and wide open to uh, the sort of things that we've seen going on in other countries. So uh, thank you very much for your attendance tonight. Thank you to the university, to uh, the university staff, particularly the um, team downstairs. They've been very good to work with. This is a fantastic facility. Thank you to the Venture Centre. I need to single them out. Um, they're the sort of people who give me hope for the future. Uh, they are some really committed people who are trying to get young social entrepreneurs, not even young social entrepreneurs, old people like me, uh, on, the, on the path to entrepreneurship to solve some of our really intractable social and economic uh, problems, actually encouraging entrepreneurship at, at that level. And uh, they do it on a shoestring. So thank you to them. They've given us Jack to record this lecture tonight. And thank you to our colleagues and partners at Mackenzie Elvin for uh, participating in this. Thank you to our councillors for coming along. And uh, Jan Tenney was here as before. Um, I really appreciate your attendance and your interest. So. Uh, Go and have a meal together, talk about it. Talk about it amongst your friends. And uh, I'd like to think that uh, our firm would be back here next year with another lecture. We'll see. We're working on it. Thank you again. Thank you.